Hey, welcome back to La Belle Vie and our weekly law and crime update. <clears throat> so starting off with the Sarah Boone case. So there was a status hearing this past Friday, and what is most significant is that the court has ordered that the case is set to remain as previously set. So that means we're still on track for the final pretrial, com pretrial conference for March 28th, with the trial set to begin on April 10th. Um, the order has the, sit, the trial to be um, approximately three weeks. So, um, so that's great. Uh, so we'll see. But it looks like, as I, as I anticipated, the court wants this, this case to move forward to trial. There were also some discovery motions by the defense for some additional costs for a private investigator. Hopefully, this is just some final discovery matters because we know that a PI had already been engaged and had spent thousands of dollars um, previously with um, her first attorney. So hopefully that's not gonna delay things. The court minutes also indicated that the defense is to submit an order for the Regional Conflict Council to render their discovery. And if you recall in my video, what is going on with Sarah Boone's representation, um, this past summer of 2022, she had a number of attorneys once her first primary attorney was able to withdraw for reconcilable differences. And the reason for those numbers of attorneys was because there had been a number of conflicts. Um, the first attorney had represented the victim. Another attorney had represented a witness that is expected to testify. So if you remember, there was a lot of that. Well, and in that time, apparently the RCC, when they were representing Sarah, may have received some discovery. So there was a motion um, for the defense um, to get that discovery. So um, I'll continue to monitor any developments, but hopefully things will stay quiet until March 28th, and uh, we don't. Hopefully, we just don't see any more delays. I'm also planning on some interesting background content that I'm going to be working on in March in advance of the March 28th pretrial conference. So stay tuned for that. Okay, so the Murdoch case. A lot happened this week on the Murdoch case, um, and if you. Um, weren't aware it was actually supposed to end this Friday, which clearly is not happening. But in any event, we started the week with a lot of financial testimony regarding the various financial crimes that Alec Murdoch has either already admitted to have um, committed or is accused of having committed. So we heard from his former best friend um, with whom he used to hide the fact that he had taken almost $800,000, I think it was like $792,000 in attorney's fees that were supposed to have gone directly into the firm because the fees belong to the firm, um, not Alec individually, but he had kind of basically used his friend um, who he had worked as co-counsel with a case to kind of hide that his portion of the $800,000. So we heard a lot of testimony on that. Um, we also heard from another victim it was probably the, the saddest part of the testimony this week. It was um, one of the sons of um, the Murdoch's former housekeeper that had uh, sadly died when she had tripped on some steps at the Murdoch Moselle property where the murders take, took place. Um, this had happened, I think, in 2018. So um, in any event, it's a long convoluted story, but to get to the chase, basically, Alec admitted to ultimately stealing millions of dollars of the recovery that um, he had arranged for his friend to get through a, a wrongful death case um, that was brought against him and his insurance. And, um, and he had basically never gave it to those boys. And so um, there was a lot of testimony in that, both on... Um, on the attorney that had represented them, but also the, the victim himself, one of the boys, and they testified and it was just heartbreaking. Um, and uh, it, in that matter, uh, Murdoch had actually admitted to um, the theft and that was actually ultimately what led to his disbarment. So then um, we, at, at some point during a lot of this financial testimony, the defense filed a motion for mistrial arguing that the amount of financial evidence that was allowed to be con to continue to be admitted had, was more prejudicial than probative, um, which is the evidentiary standard for getting in character evidence, 404 evidence. You probably heard a lot about that. And so um, the judge 
took the matter into consideration and ultimately determined that the evidence was more probative than prejudicial. And so they did allow continued more um, of this financial crime to, um, evidence. Now, the concern I have, and I think a lot of people have, is that at one point are we having all of these financial evidence coming in, and is that coming to the point where it's so cumulative that it is going to be prejudicial to the point where we're really on trial for a financial crimes, not murder? Um, so, you know, in that respect, we are seeing more of the actual murder evidence towards the end of the week. So we'll have to see, but I can, I can pretty much bet that if um, Mr. Murdoch is ultimately convicted, I have a strong suspicion that this issue will be something that will be considered upon appeal. So um, it, it's definitely a gray issue. Um, so I think, I think you could probably bet on that being something that would be brought up. Um, towards the end of the week, it got a little more interesting. We heard from two witnesses, we heard from a number of witnesses, but the two that I thought were most compelling were first um, the testimony from Mr. Murdoch's um, parents, his mother's caretaker. So if um, you recall that at the time of the murders, Mr. Murdoch's father was actually in the hospital dying and his mother was um, living in their home, his parents' home, but she had had pretty severe Alzheimer's. And um, so she had 24 hour care. And so um, the witness that testified was her evening caregiver. And so she testified to um, the facts about, if you recall that Alec did go to see his mother. We don't quite know the timeline, but we think it's around 9.06 PM, the night of the murders and came back around 10ish when he arrived back to the property and ultimately called 911. Um, what was interesting about this testimony was that she testified that Alec was only there for about 20 minutes, um, which does cut into the, the, the timeline and, and also really narrows the timeline for the defense. But what I think was even more damaging was that what she testified was that several days later after the murders, he kind of mentioned to her, well, I was there for 30, 40 minutes. And um, that really bothered her. It was it was really heartbreaking testimony because she was very upset and clearly cared for the family. So I thought that was really compelling. I also thought that the testimony we heard Friday um, from Blanca, the former long-term house manager, I'd say she, she, it sounds like she ran the household and was really close to the family and had worked for them for years and was in particular, in particular, really close with Maggie and the boys. Um, she talked a lot about, you know, the last time she saw Paul and, um, and, and of course, the morning of the murders, she talked about um, what Alec was wearing and this seafoam shirt that was a polo shirt, not a button up shirt. She was very clear on that. So again, showing um, evidence for the prosecution that that was the shirt that he was wearing when he went to work was not the same blue shirt that he was wearing when that snapshot video that Paul took when he when Alec was standing by that tree, which was I think around 745 ish, you know, so within an hour or so from the when the murders occurred. So the prosecution and then the other thing she testified to was that he was also wearing different shoes in that snapshot video than the brown leather shoes he wore to work. And Finally, what she testified to was that she never saw those two pieces of items of clothing ever again. So the prosecution, of course, is going to try to argue that that means he basically got rid of them, disposed of them, destroyed them, hid them, who knows. Um, so I think that was why that was um, that testimony was significant. On the flip side, though, there was some helpful testimony from Blanca um, for the defense. One, just I think showing how much she cared about um, the family. She testified about Alec's relationship with Maggie and that he basically, Maggie was his world. Um, so again, going against this argument that he would kill her then. Um, she also testified about um, the morning after the murders, Alec uh, and Buster, his son, were staying at their parents' property and he had asked... Um, uh, Blanca, if she would go back to the house and kind of fix things up, because presumably he knew there were a lot of people were going to be coming into town. 
um, and would be at the home. And so when Blanca testified, when she arrived to the home, it had already, the house itself had already been released. So it was no longer, SLED was no longer, the state investigative agency, which is called SLED, was no longer um, in the home investigating. And so she walked around and she talked about some pots that she would have expected the dinner pots to be still on the stove, but they were in in the kitchen i think the defense could probably argue as they did there were lots of people that were there at the home that night after the murders someone could have easily put the pots into the refrigerator so i don't i didn't really take much into that testimony but what i did think was interesting was she testified that when she went into the bathroom there was a kind of a wet towel on the floor it looked there, there had some water that someone had taken a shower and that there were a pair of pants on the floor and um, what the defense is trying to get out of that is that why didn't they take that? Why didn't SLED take that evidence? And, you know, kind of showing that this argument that maybe SLED wasn't so thorough and maybe was sloppy in their investigation. Um, again, trying to kind of create, you know, any type of pieces of evidence of um, reasonable doubt. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, and again, kind of getting more to the 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 testimony that really relates more directly to the murders themselves and what was going on at the time. Now we do understand that the prosecution is expected to end their case, um, their direct case next Wednesday, and then it will go be turned over to the defense to present their defense. Um, I don't know how long that's going to take. I, I I doubt seriously it's going to end next week because if the prosecution is going to go to Wednesday, I don't think the defense is going to um, end after two days. And of course, we can have re rebuttal um, by the prosecution. So I, I would guess that we're probably looking at least through next week, possibly through the following week too, but if not, maybe ending the following week. But I think we're for sure have a full week of testimony next week. So I'll be watching that and um, I'll give you an update next week. So then on the Rust case, we've had a lot of developments this past, past week in Rust. So um, first, uh, Alex Murdoch, I mean, Alec Baldwin, I always say Alec Murdoch. I apologize. There's two Alex <laughs> going on in these really interesting trials at the time um, right now. But okay, Alec Baldwin um, has made several motions in the criminal matter. First, he's filed a motion to have the special prosecutor removed because she has now, um, she's now a member of the New Mexico State Legislature. So since this time, she's been elected in the fall 2022 uh, 22 election, she won a seat in the New Mexico State House. So they're um, trying to argue that it would be unfair for her as a legislator and a prosecutor to kind of wear both hats. I think it's an interesting argument um, from the language in the motion. I'm not sure there's precedent that squarely addresses this issue because they talk a lot about how this would be bad precedent. So I think we'll have to see where that goes. Um, I think that the motion that they made that has a really, really strong argument was that they also filed a motion that stated that the second claim this so remember there's two charges of involuntary manslaughter that the and that the state has given the the opportunity for the jury ultimately if this goes to trial to choose between the kind of basic involuntary manslaughter which it includes um jail time up to 18 months or the separate fireman enhancement statute which would allow for prison time up to five years obviously the more serious of the criminal charges. Well, what is interesting is the motion, the defense has filed a motion to dismiss that firearm enhancement involuntary manslaughter charge because that statute was not enacted until May of 2022. So after the incident. And if all that's true, um, I, I agree, that would violate the ex post facto clause of the US Constitution. You cannot be charged with a crime that was not in place at the time of the action. So at the time of the shooting, if that law wasn't in place, you can't go back and charge somebody, someone for something that wasn't in existence at the time of the act. So I agree, I think that one probably has a very strong likelihood, unless there's something that we're not seeing under New, York, New Mexico law 
Um, I think that one they have a good chance. They also filed, and that would actually benefit Ms. Reed as well. So I'm sure, you know, that's great for her, you know, kind of like bootstrap along with Alan's, you know, top of the notch, you know, top flight um, defense that he's getting. I mean, he's got the best. So um, the February, he also filed a motion for a speedy trial, which uh, shouldn't be an issue for the prosecution unless, unless, unless though they have this motion to remove the special prosecutor. Hmm. Because what the, the motion for the speedy trial basically means that the defendant has the right to file a motion for speed trial and then the, the, the prosecution has to be ready to go. And I would normally say that shouldn't be an issue because this has been going on forever. I mean, the incident happened in October of 2021. We've had this extensive investigation, including firearm analysis by the FBI. So I would have presumed that we were, the state would be ready to go. Um, but that's interesting. If, if, the, if they win on the move, removal of the special, special prosecutor, because if you recall, the reason they got the special prosecutor was because the DA said that they just don't have the resources to focus their time and attention on this high profile case. So that will be interesting. We'll have to see where that goes. Um, February 24th is um, the first appearance date for Mr. Baldwin and Ms. Reed, um, and it apparently is going to be streamed, so I will be covering that, so stay tuned. So finally, oh, oh, there's one last thing on the, um, on the Russ case that's not relating to the criminal charges, but is relating to the whole incident itself. We had a, a lawsuit filed, one of many, this week. Um, this one is was brought by the very famous um, attorney Gloria Allred against um, uh, on behalf of um, Helena Hutchinson's parents. They're Ukra her Ukrainian parents. She's from Ukraine, so from her mom and her dad and her sister. And it's separate from the wrongful death case that was brought by her husband and was settled last year. This is not for wrongful death. This is for loss of consortium, loss of the love and affection claims, um, intentional affliction of emotional distress, negligence type claims. So it is a separate causes of action. Uh, we'll have to see where that goes. I mean, obviously being represented by a very powerful um, lawyer, so we'll have to see where that one goes. But that one is against the production company, Baldwin individually, the producers individually. I mean, it's against the kitchen sink. I mean, she's brought it against um, the armor, the prop master, the AD, the line producer, you know, everyone's involved. So we'll have to see where that one goes, but stay tuned. Um, finally, one case that I'm thinking of covering is the Samantha Markle, the Megan Markle defamation case. Now this one is currently pending in federal court in the Middle District of Florida um, on based on diversity jurisdiction. So the cause of action itself is based on state law, Florida defamation law. So being a Florida lawyer, I'm licensed in Florida and Illinois, um, it would be interesting to cover. Uh, I think I'm going to see the, how things go. We have a motion to dismiss that's been brought by Meghan Markle, and the hearing on that is this Wednesday. Um, so that will be interesting. But what is also interesting is that the judge has said that if the case does move forward, they have granted Samantha Markle's motion to compel discovery. And so what that means is if the case moves forward and it is not dismissed on Wednesday, then um, the Meghan Markle and will have to submit to the discovery requests, which includes depositions. So that'll be really interesting. And I'm thinking of covering that one. Like I said, I'm gonna wait until Wednesday to see what happens with the motion to dismiss. Obviously, if it's dismissed, I'm not gonna cover it, but um, that's one I'm thinking of covering. So let me know if, you, if you're interested in that one. It'd be easy for me to cover it. Um, and I think it's really fascinating on the pop, kind of the pop culture side. Um, so let me know. Um, but thanks again so much for joining on our weekly update. I really appreciate it. Um, if you could consider liking and subscribing, that would be great. And have a wonderful day. Thanks so much.